2024, we're going to make Donald Trump a loser again. This week in Pennsylvania, a nationwide Biden blitz for the black vote is launched in Philadelphia. Another lawsuit against PA mail-in ballots over those pesky dates on the outer envelope. We're talking to the lawyer who filed it. And we're talking to the former team doctor for Penn State football who sued and won millions after accusing head coach James Franklin of meddling in medical decisions. Hello and welcome to This Week in Pennsylvania. Welcome to June. I'm Dennis Owens. We're covering hot topics in PA policy and politics, as well as the issues important to you and your family. Well, never before have these words been uttered in the 250 years of American history. A former president convicted. But Donald Trump found guilty on 34 counts this week. He calls it a disgrace. Many Republican lawmakers in Pennsylvania agree and sent scathing statements calling it persecution. But Trump said the only verdict that matters is from voters November 5th. So might another historic statement be coming? Former president convicted, reelected? We will discuss the impact of the verdict on PA voters with our analysts later in the show. Well, there are red states and blue states, but President Biden made clear this week his main target is black and brown in all the states. He kicked off a nationwide campaign to win back communities of color that polls suggest have been defecting in big numbers. Both Joe Biden and Vice President Harris kicked it off in Philadelphia's black communities, arguing that their administration has been good for minority groups, that former President Trump would not be, and they need their votes come November. With your voice, and your power, we will win again. Black voters place enormous faith in me. I've tried to do my best to honor that trust. The polls suggest especially black men have soured on the president in large part because of inflation and the economy. Well, the Biden-Harris team also enlisted the help of the two most powerful African-Americans in the state. Lieutenant Governor Austin Davis, Speaker of the House Joanna McClinton, who are vowing to work hard to deliver Biden victory in November and to remind black voters why that's so important. From protecting our democracy to securing our fundamental freedoms to beating back MAGA extremism, black voters in Pennsylvania, we cannot afford a second Trump term. President Biden has been fighting every day to create more black wealth, to make sure that we're creating ladders of opportunity for every person to have a shot to succeed in, in America. And the push to win over black voters includes the capital city. Biden's senior advisor, Tom Perez, nice. toured affordable, affordable housing projects in Harrisburg. He touted the federal money that made them possible. We met Damon Taylor, a former homeless vet who now has a roof over his head. But there was an awkward moment. Damon invited Perez and the media in to show us his digs. The TV was on and playing was an anti-Biden TV commercial blasting him for a failed economy. Republicans and the Trump campaign will continue to pound that point right up until Election Day. The state apparently has a dating issue. Dates on the mail-in ballots continue to be at the center of lawsuits, one of which was filed this week. The outer envelopes, you see it, they have the two and the zero. All voters have to do is write in the two and the four for 2024. But thousands continue to screw it up and their votes are not counted. That's unconstitutional, argues the ACLU, which sued this week, arguing the dates are superfluous and unnecessary, so they shouldn't force otherwise legitimate votes to be discarded. The state Supreme Court previously and a federal appeals court recently said because signing and dating is in the law that created mail-in ballots, they must be done or those votes should not count. Joining me now is the lawyer for the ACLU, Steve Loney. Thanks for joining us. You've sued a few times. The courts keep saying, yeah, you might be right. Dating the outer envelope is insignificant, but it is in the law. So why do you keep suing? Thank you for having me, Dennis. Um, well, the courts haven't just said you might be right. They have confirmed we are absolutely right. That date requirement, that date line on the envelope is absolutely meaningless. No county, no state official, no election official uses it for any purpose except for to see whether people have complied and written the date in. And under those circumstances, we have sued to make sure that that date requirement does not get applied to disenfranchise people and deny them their constitutional right to vote. What's the new wrinkle in the, in the, in the lawsuit that you filed this week from previous ones? This is the first lawsuit that squarely addresses the state constitutional right to vote. 
So we as Pennsylvanians have a fundamental right to vote under the Pennsylvania Constitution. And that's something that none of the prior lawsuits have really engaged with. And so uh, after several rounds of litigation in state and federal court, we're finally going to the state courts and asking them to make the call under the state constitution that this date requirement can't be applied to deny people their fundamental right to vote. Obviously, you'd prefer for lawmakers to just go back into the law and, and fix this thing up. What's the likelihood that happens before the election? Uh, before the election, it seems like there's precious little time to uh, amend the election code. Uh, we obviously think that that would be a fantastic <laughs> development. It would eliminate the need for me to spend all of my time litigating this case. But uh, unfortunately, that hasn't happened. Um, and amending the election code can be a Herculean task. So we acknowledge that. Um, fortunately, though, we already have the Pennsylvania Constitution and the Free and Equal Elections Clause. Lastly and quickly, real quick, what do you say to people say, it just isn't that tough. There's already the two and the zero. All you got to do, there's directions. What's with these people that can't figure it out? Well, I would say that people from all walks of life get tripped up by this. It, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a speed bump in the process of voting. It's, it's friction added to the process for no reason. And what I would say to them is for those of us who have a fundamental right to vote, which is all eligible Pennsylvanians, um, that right can't be denied without a really good reason, without the best reason. Okay. And just adding another requirement for no reason at all is okay. not good enough to disenfranchise tens of thousands of people. And that's what's happening. So you might think it's simple, but there are thousands of people in every election who are getting tripped up by this. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. We got to run. Okay, Thank concern you. about the upcoming election is bipartisan when it comes to the possible role of artificial intelligence. A group of lawmakers are working on a fix, including a bill that would penalize campaigns that use artificially created voices and images without authorization. This comes after Democratic voters in New Hampshire got a phone call from someone sounding like President Joe Biden, but it was not. The call encouraged them to stay home for the primary and to wait until the general election in November. Senate Bill 1217 would fine groups intentionally creating false narratives less than 90 days before an election. AI is out there. The, the, the horse has left the barn. We are trying to foster innovation with AI, but also put some guardrails on AI so it's not used in a nefarious way. I believe that it will get done because it's going to affect everybody. And, and, and it's not a Republican and a Democrat thing. It's, it's, it's all of us. It's going, to, it's going to affect everybody here. They hope the bill will get fast-tracked during the budget, so it's enacted in time for the November election. A former Penn State football team doctor got a multi-million dollar award from a Dauphin County jury this week after he says he was fired for complaining about interference from head coach James Franklin. Dr. Scott Lynch got $5.2 million in the civil trial, $5 million of that in punitive damages. He was removed in 2019, he argued, because he was pressured by Franklin to rush players back onto the field too quickly. When he brought what he insists is that inner, inappropriate interference by a coach to his superiors, he was removed. Penn State Health said it's disappointed by the verdict and may appeal it. Lynch, a former NCAA champion wrestler at Penn State, says undue pressuring of athletic trainers and doctors is not just a Nittany Lion problem, it's widespread, it's nonsense, and it needs to stop. My overarching goal is to bring attention to this issue so we can get policy or legislation or whatever it is to protect these kids. They're still kids. Many of these kids don't have good home lives. If the doctor there doesn't protect them, nobody else is. That's the issue, and that's what needs to change. I asked Lynch if there isn't a natural and common tension between team doctors and team coaches because coaches want their best players on the field. He said Franklin would intimidate team doctors and trainers. However, his predecessor, Bill O'Brien, never did. Coming up, can you name the longest tenured legislative leader in Harrisburg right now? We'll not only tell you who it is, we'll talk to it right after the break. This PA Chamber Minute is paid for by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry. I'm joined by a very special guest today, State Senator Kristen Phillips-Hill, to talk about her work to reform the state permitting system. Senator, 
Thanks, Luke. Republicans and Democrats may not always agree, but here's an area where we find common ground. It's that we need to address our slow, outdated, and not customer-friendly permitting system. It's so frustrating. I've watched my neighbors move to other states because they can get a business permit approved in a timely manner, or receive a state teaching certificate, a nursing license, or real estate license faster in another state than they could in Pennsylvania. We can turn this around. We need to turn this around. Our best opportunities for our future generations lie ahead, but we need to confront the challenges today. I've introduced bipartisan legislation that will modernize and improve our permitting system. Visit my website to find out how we can turn Pennsylvania around. Welcome back to This Week in Pennsylvania. We're joined now by Senate Minority Leader Jay Costa, a Democrat from Pittsburgh, and he is the longest tenured leader in the General Assembly. You've been in the state Senate nearly 30 years, leader for 14. Uh, the budget is due in less than a month. Where exactly are we on that? I think, Dennis, we are progressing through the process. As you indicated, we have a month before uh, June 30th deadline arrives. I think resource-wise, we are well positioned in Pennsylvania with better than a $14 billion budget surplus. And, but also this year, we're seeing now that uh, now that we're moving into June, we're probably going to have an $800 million excess surplus uh, just for this fiscal year. So we're well positioned to make investments, to be thoughtful, and figuring out ways in which we can return some of that money back to Pennsylvania taxpayers. Well, your Republican colleagues, actually the Senate passed a bill. They've got an idea with that $14 billion surplus you just talked about. How about we reduce the personal income tax from 3.07 to 2.8 percent. That would take care of it. But uh, Governor Josh Shapiro and I assume you have some plans for what you call investing that, which means spending that and not giving it all back in terms of an income tax cut. Is that correct? That is correct. I mean, while we recognize that that's one option that we can look at as we go forward over the course of this next month, you know, we recognize that we're going to return resources back to our Commonwealth residents that we're better suited, for example, if we provide maybe a one-time one lump sum payment back to folks, they can immediately put it back into the economy. Or we can look at something similar to what we did before with the child care and dependent care tax credit program, this time maybe an earned income tax credit as something we can look at going forward for Pennsylvania, a specific one for Pennsylvania that would provide ongoing savings to, to folks as we go forward. And, you know, we think that that's more appropriate. I think it's a more impactful um, return to resources to folks. And that's why we're looking at that. But that has to be coupled with investments. And that's what we're looking and talking about in terms of making certain that we invest in education where we have an obligation to do that based upon our court cases. We have an obligation to grow jobs and make investments in economic development programs, as the governor has talked about, particularly in the five sectors that he's talked about, which we think is extremely important. So those are two major points of discussion we believe are going to be part of the budget process as we go forward. Well, you call it investment. It is spending. A lot of that program, Republicans argue, uh, would put taxpayers on the hook for that in the out years. And that once that $14 billion is gone and it would be gone post haste, even the independent fiscal office says that, then you'd have to raise taxes in a couple of years to keep up with the spending that you're creating now. What's your uh, answer to that? Dennis, I, I vehemently disagree with that analysis that Senate Republicans have come forward with. You know, they, that was the argument they made back in February before they decided to spend $3 billion on a personal income tax cut, which will be recurring as well. I think when you make investments, whether it be in education, economic development, and other types of programs, you generate resources for the Commonwealth. You generate tax resources that allows that uh, program to move forward and be able to generate the revenue needs to ultimately pay for itself. We need to make Pennsylvania more uh, tax friendly. We need to take steps along the lines of looking at our business tax cut programs as well to be able to allow for the opportunity for companies to want to come here. We want we have to establish our sites program, as the governor talked about, uh, putting resources into a sites program that's going to attract businesses to want to come here in a short period of time to be able to get them to come here, set up shop and, and get it, get to work. So uh, I don't buy that argument. We have to be thoughtful. We have to be strategic with respect to how we enact this budget and recognize that we, not, we know we can't spend $14 billion over the next half dozen years or so, but we do need to position Pennsylvania to be successful in growing jobs, growing tax revenue, and by making investments, that's one of the ways in which you can do that. And as I mentioned, at the same time, we can put money back into people's pockets to allow them to stimulate the economy as well 
by having excess resources available to them as but well. It, it seems there's a big different difference of opinion on what to do with that money. And when you throw the governor in, he's yet an, another uh, opinion, an important one, a seat at the table. Uh, the budget's doing like three weeks. I'm at the Capitol almost every day, and the conventional wisdom there is there's no way this thing's done on June 30th. What do you say to that? Uh, I'm an optimist. I think that we can get there. I think it requires us to be able to be in the same room together and talk to one another. Um, and I think that's what you're going to start to see happening as we go forward. At okay. the minimum, Democrats are working with the governor. I presume the governor's office is working uh, with Republicans as well. But, you know, now we're heading into June. We're back into session. I think you're going to see opportunities to have face-to-face -face conversations about the budget, uh, start to ramp up and move forward. And I'm confident that I think that we can't get there by June 30th. Real, we real, have to have the will Well, let me get a real quick, Senator, I want to get a real quick political question in. You are, are yes, you trail in the Senate, 28 Republicans, 22 Democrats. If you pick up three seats, you would regain. Can you do That's that correct. in this election? Absolutely, we can do that. And I think between a number of various issues, um, looking at some of the issues that we think we're on the right side of and our opponents are not, most importantly, the redistricting process has allowed us the opportunity to be able to at least win one seat and approved districts in three other seats. So we're confident okay. that we can get there. Thank you very, very much for your time. We sure do appreciate it. Have a great rest of your weekend. Stay with us. Thanks, More This Week in Pennsylvania when we come back. And welcome back to This Week in Pennsylvania. We are joined Christopher Nicholas, Eagle Consulting Group, Danielle Gross, Clearpoint <laughs> Communications. Two impeachments, <laughs> four indictments didn't seem to have an impact. Will a guilty on 34 count verdict in New York matter to Pennsylvania voters when it comes to Donald Trump? I believe it will. Um, the, the issue is, is that there is a core of voters who will always vote for Donald Trump no matter what. But uh, convicted felon President Trump needs to win not only those people, but moderates and independents. And it's those people who I think he will lose as a result of his felony convictions. So it was a big day yesterday. Credit card processors made a lot of money because both Trump and Biden had unprecedented amounts of <laughs> campaign contributions online. It is a challenge for Trump. His campaign has always been used to kind of navigating lots of turbulence, and this is more for them. The thing I would stress to our viewers is do not buy into the insta polls you're going to mm. see in the next couple of days. This is going to take a little while to burn in because both Biden and Trump, having been around so long, are very well-known candidates. And we've never had this before, so we can't say, hey, last time this happened, we know X and Y. Well, in 2016, Donald Trump did say that any candidate under even felony indictment was should be disqualified for running for president. A uh, little irony. Yeah, but that uh, was eight for years 2024. ago. <laughs> and it um, wasn't him. So regardless, he was okay with it. regardless of your politics, it is massively historic that we may, on November 6th, say convicted, former president, reelected. And as we sit here in June, that's possible. So Pennsylvania is on a razor's edge. All the polling I've seen, uh, Trump has a slight lead within margin of error. Uh, one of the reasons uh, Biden keeps coming here because he hasn't locked down the minority vote which is something Democrats usually do much earlier. So he's having his own troubles too. But if you only move a couple thousand votes here and there uh, because of this, uh, it could have an impact. But remember, we have a, we have a debate later in June. We have Trump sentencing in mid-July. Then Trump will the soon convention. Pick, well, he has to pick his his vice presidential designee. So and we have whatever might happen a couple as a of, result of that <clears throat> A couple of big things to still go, yeah. Yeah. What's what I mean, what does it say about us? I mean, you know, the thing that's really sad is that there are a lot of people out there who are convicted felons who've served their time. And, uh, you know, they face a lot of hurdles um, coming back into society. And here we have a rich, wealthy white man um, who is coming back into perhaps the most the opportunity well, to get the most powerful job in the United States. And we should note, he's going to appeal it. He believes it was a miscarriage of justice. and there's, So that journey isn't over yet. His, right. his legal journey Correct. isn't over. Our journey for this segment is over, but we're coming right back. That's the good news. Don't go anywhere. More This Week in Pennsylvania when we come right back. This Week in Pennsylvania. More with Chris and Danielle. Call it the Biden blitzkrieg for the black vote. It began in Philadelphia this week. They're quite matter of fact about their intentions. They need the black vote. They want to remind black voters exactly uh, why it's important that they get that vote. Uh, what does this tell you that they're doing this kind of a, uh, a blitzkrieg in, in early June, late May, early June? 
I, I think it shows how weak the Biden campaign is. It was not just Biden, but his vice president came to Philadelphia mm -hmm. for, I don't know, the 218th time or something. And it's not a good sign when the Democratic incumbent president hasn't locked down the black vote uh, in, you know, early June. Uh, that's something that should have been put in his back pocket. Last week, you saw Trump campaigning on Biden's side of the field, the other guy's side of the field, by having a campaign rally in the Bronx, talking to the Libertarian Party convention. That didn't that quite go. Well. That didn't quite go as <laughs> planned, but still, you've, you've got Trump kind of playing offense and Biden still playing uh, defense. And that is, uh, it, to me, shows Biden's weakness. You know, to me, it shows that he's not taking anything for granted. Uh, you know, Chris might think it shows weakness. I think it shows, you know, a gratitude and a commitment uh, to the folks who helped put him there. And reminding the folks about all the things that the Biden administration has accomplished, something that folks on my side of the aisle have been, you know, yelling for, for yeah. months that the, that the Biden administration isn't so great at talking about their accomplishments. I think people understand what he has done and what he hasn't done. And every time they go to buy groceries or gas, they are reminded about the things that really matter to them. They're having and that's, the lowest rate of inflation in the free world. That's why Trump uh, is been gaining on him well, among those communities. Low, low rate of inflations and uh, record stock markets are fine for much of the, the populace. There's nothing more regressive than inflation to poorer communities because mm -hmm. they have to put gas in the car. They have to get groceries. They're feeling that impact in the Biden uh, administration and you guys want to shout it, get it, but I'm still having to show up to the gas pump. So how do you, how do you square that circle? Well, between before election day uh, adjusted for inflation the price of gas has been um, actually not it has declined again uh, rather so that's a gumby like contortion to try to tell people <laughs> when they're the ones having to go to the go to the gas pump well the the democrats are the ones trying to put money back in people's yeah. pockets biden has been trying to tell people for a year that his version of the economics biden economy is working and people are basically saying nope it's not so he's going to keep pounding his head against the wall? Okay, he's going to keep having to have events in Philly like this. <laughs> okay, and we'll continue to cover them, and it's going to be of quite course. interesting. We're in the We're here last five week. months of the election. We're here every week, Dennis. Thanks for joining us for This Week in Pennsylvania. <laughs> you missed any of the show, you can catch it on thisweekinpennsylvania.com. That's real original. We'll see you next week.